Dick Cavett Show. Tonight, next guests are Jackie Robinson, George Clinton, author of The Naked Children, Daniel Fader, and Bob Rosengarten and the orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Cavett. Jackie Robinson has been called the most uh, exciting player of his time. Baseball fans remember with particular pleasure his ability to drive pitchers wild uh, by just sort of standing on third base and threatening to steal home faster than you could say uh, his name, probably. He's the uh, man who broke the color line in baseball in 1947. Seems like a long time ago. He's a member of baseball's Hall of Fame, of course, and he's uh, left baseball and become a highly combative man in a number of areas and fields. Um, and uh, speaks his mind. Will you welcome, please, Mr. Jackie Robinson. Is it possible that it's been a quarter of a century since you first played in the major leagues? I can't believe yeah, I guess I can believe it. It's, a, it's on the books, isn't it? It's every bit of that. It seems a lot longer. Yeah. yeah. Did you think things would come as far as they have? Or did you ever think it might not work? Well, there were times, certainly, when we thought it wouldn't work. But with the numbers of people that helped, yeah. we certainly thought that things would go as they have now, and even a lot further in terms of the front office and the managerial role and that kind of thing. But certainly mm -hmm. baseball has got, got grown considerably, and we're quite proud of the role that we played in it. It's incredible now to think of a sport that big that was all, uh, all non-black. Yes. I mean, uh, so many uh, black stars in baseball now. Really well, uh, you can't even count them a day. I, it's amazing to me. I keep reading about certain ball players, and I, one day I look on television, and he's black. There's no longer a mention of Joe Blow, Negro ball player, this kind of thing, which is as it should be. I think they should be judged solely on their abilities out there, and the race shouldn't have anything to do with it. But they always used to, of course, they mentioned it for several years. It was, it was like, an, and, and in this corner, and a credit to his race on radio, they always used to say that, and that way you knew. Right. Uh, no, no white man was ever a credit to his race on radio. It was always, <laughs> always black. Uh, there must have been tough times. Uh, well, obviously, there must have been tough times. But I often wonder how you got what temper you have to have under control at times. So, Weren't things yelled at you? And oh, there were a number of things, but uh, I worked for a great guy. I don't think anybody um, could have done the job had it not been for Mr. Ricky. He was constantly advising and guiding, and I had so much confidence in him, I would have jumped off the bridge if he told me to do it. That's, uh, that's how much I believed in him. And he was uh, a man who was sincere and dedicated and willing to lend that helping hand that's so needed today in terms of the problems that we face in everyday life. Brent Not enough Ricky. people are willing to do as Mr. Ricky did. What, did. what advice did he give you, though, about when you get out there and somebody's going to yell? Well, what was yelled at you? What kind of things Well, <laughs> you name them in terms of race, and they were yelled. Mm -hmm. Everything it was quite vicious. I think it's Philadelphia Phillies with Ben Chapman was perhaps the most vicious of any of the people in terms of name calling. The team members? Some members of the team, but there is a fellow by the name of Lee Hanley on that ball club that came down to first base when I was there and apologized for the Phillies. He just says, I just want you to know all of us don't feel that way, but it's been led by the manager and many of the guys are doing it simply because of instructions, I would have to imagine, but it did give me a good feeling to know that in spite of what was coming out of the Philly dugout, one guy would come down and say he's awfully sorry, and, and actually what they did was to sort of solidify the Brooklyn Ball Club, because Mr. Ricky told me one of the things he said early was that when your ball club starts to take up for you in certain situations, our battle is most of the way won, and, mm -hmm. and I think that Philly incident started the Dodgers to kind of mold as a unit. Was that the worst, Philly? 
Yes, yeah. Philly was the worst. Uh, yeah. Ben really? Chapman was quite vicious. He, he wasn't only vicious as far as black people were concerned. I think he was anti-everything. Mm -hmm. so he, he, but Where is he today? <laughs> God only knows. Yeah. Uh, did, um, but the team members, was this while you were on, when you came onto the field that they would yell things, or was it while the game was going on? I mean, could some of it have been just strategy <laughs> to help get Well, they thought, I, I was, I'm sure that a lot of it was thought to be strategy, but... Mm -hmm. um, uh, it wasn't going to upset me. There was really too much to be done at that particular time in terms of breaking the baseball barrier to allow uh, name calling to bother me. I keep remembering what my mother told me when I was a kid, although I've always been a guy that turned back. She said something about sticks and stones will break your bones, you know, and mm -hmm. so not to be concerned about it. Well, I didn't at the time, uh, and fortunate for the advice that uh, I got from Mr. Rickey and the, the encouragement and the guidance I got from my wife at home, we were able to, to withstand most of the kinds of situations that came up. We were prepared because of the numbers of people on our side. Yeah. I've heard that some of the uh, players since have felt guilty about not supporting you, that people have come up and said, I wish at the time I had uh, well, been a little braver or something well like i that. think carl erskine who in my opinion probably had the most understanding of the whole situation he was mm -hmm. quite concerned uh in roger khan's book boys of the summer he he points out that he would feel awfully guilty when we go into a restaurant in the south and all the white fellows would be able to go in and sit down and eat and the rest of us would have to sit in the bus and wait for a sandwich or something to be brought out to us and he was guilty that he didn't participate more but I, I, when I think about guys like that, I have to think about lending a helping hand. The Pee Wee Reese's, for instance, a Southerner. And I, I really believe that it was the Southerner on our ball club that, that made the Ricky experiment much more of a success than anything else because I, I'm sure that all of their lives had heard that there was a great deal of difference between blacks and whites. And when they started to associate with us and they found out that all of the things people said that you use the same locker rooms, the same showers, the same facilities, something's going to happen, mm -hmm. they lost that fear after a short time and they became, I guess, as aggressive in terms of the success as anybody. Of course, I feel a little good too about it, Dick, because all that time was happening, nothing was happening to me either, you know, so yeah. while they had their fears that things were going to happen to me, to them, I, yeah. I felt good because nothing was happening to me as well, so it made it kind of an even kind of a situation. But the whole situation in, in breaking the barrier was done simply because we had a purpose in mind to go out and win. Mm -hmm. And and first it was Montreal, then you moved into a town like Brooklyn, and it was just fantastic way the fans responded and reacted. They were a great bunch of people, and I've always been a very appreciative for the support and guidance that we got from fans as well as from Mr. Ricky and the family. Mm -hmm. Hold on just a moment, will you, while I sell a tiny automobile. What's being done to take the automobile out of the air pollution problem? Here's Jack Nicholas with an interesting message from Pontiac. <laughs> Talking with Jackie Robinson, one of the most remarkable athletes, and uh, you're into so many other things now. You're doing it. What is the Jackie Robinson Construction Company? Well, we formed a construction company about five months ago with a fellow by the name of Arthur Sutton over in uh, New Jersey. Uh, one of the things that I've always felt was if we're really to solve our problems, we, we've got to do it interracially. We, we broke the barrier in baseball on an interracial basis. Mm. And Arthur Sutton, when he started talking about the construction business, we, we felt very strongly that if we could work it in the same manner we did in baseball, Arthur being a white fellow and, and Kai Sales and I being the blacks in the organization, that we could help if we would be successful. And we're quite pleased that the construction company now is pretty much off the ground and we'll be doing some building in Brooklyn in the Bobby Kennedy uh, area that they tore down and built. We just feel that it's important to have an interracial construction company. It's important to have a black company in these times because there is a tremendous void. The is the construction union the one of the worst? For, uh... Well, yes, but I, I believe that there are a lot of black subcontractors who have gel together and mold together and uh, they're beginning to develop a system where they can break this thing down. And I think the unions are beginning to understand they've got to do it as well. I see black construction workers in New York. Um, 
Well, is, it, is it rare? Well, it's, no it, where, it, it, I just don't it's know. opening up. A few years ago, it was quite rare, but I mm -hmm. think pressures, and this is what has to happen. A lot of pressures have been applied to the different unions, and, and they are opening up, but the construction people themselves are, I think, understanding their responsibility in terms of progress in this country. Could people be cooperating with you because it's an election year, or am I reaching for something? Well, no, you're not reaching for anything. I, I think the reason why we uh, have been tremendously successful is it could be. Uh, a, an election year. We've got, gotten awfully good support from Washington. Uh, Mr. Nixon uh, and the Republicans and the power of the blacks down there from John Jenkins at Omby and Bob Brown who's the, uh, the assistant to the president right on down through the FHA have been of great assistance and they tell me they've gotten okay from, from Mr. Nixon to go ahead and do it. And, and in spite of the fact that we've been considerably critical of Mr. Nixon, uh, we have gotten the, the, the support. Governor Rockefeller, the Urban Development Corporation, I would have to think that this is perhaps the most, uh, the UDC is perhaps the most powerful agency in the country. The what? The Urban Development Urban Corporation. Yeah. They, they, they are going to develop and build housing because of the tremendous need, and I think they're going to do it in low and middle income areas. And if we can put people in decent housing, give them an opportunity to feel secure. I think this is the answer to most of the problems of today. Kids don't want to go home to lousy housing where there are seven or eight kids to a couple of rooms and have to mm -hmm. sleep in shifts. And so they're in the street, next thing you know, they're in trouble. If they give them decent housing, and I think it could help give them the kind of inspiration that's needed. Do you care if I ask you about anything at all? Anything you'd like. Well, uh, your son Jack was killed in a car accident right. not too long ago far back, and, and uh, well, there's a great amount of splashy publicity about his drug problems and all. Well, he did, Dick, have a very serious drug problem prior to his accident, yeah. but we are quite proud of the fact that our son, in spite of a very serious heroin problem, overcame it. It yeah. took three tremendous years of his life, and it took a lot of work on our part, but I think love and understanding did it for us, and we were extremely proud that Jackie did overcome it and his automobile accident had absolutely nothing to do with drugs. Mm -hmm. He was working hard on a drug on a uh, jazz program so that he could repay Daytop in some way for the work that they had done in helping him re rehabilitate himself. And um, my daughter came up from Washington and David had just come home from Stanford and we thought we'd all get together that evening and uh, for dinner, but Jackie had, on uh, that Wednesday, he taught a, a drug program every Wednesday evening. And instead of coming home that night, as he said he was, to visit with Sharon and David and myself, my wife has gone to uh, a, our uh, convention up in Massachusetts, and so that the four of us were going to get together at home. He went back up to New Haven, and uh, when David knew, uh, found out he'd gone to New Haven or didn't come home at 10 o'clock, he told Sharon to go on to bed because Jackie would be coming in very late. And he was just exhausted, and um, I checked for my own self to, with Kenny Williams up at Daytop to find out about Jackie, and he says, the one thing you can rest assured on, he was cle clean as far as drugs were concerned. So I've left it there. I'm perfectly willing because uh, I think it's one of the most difficult things that we have today, and I think our federal government is putting its priorities in the wrong place. When our youngsters have so many rocks in our heads and forms of drugs, we're sending people up to the moon, spending billions to get people up to bring rocks home for the moon and just a minute amount of money yeah. here on Earth to help our young people. And if this country is to survive, we've got to deal with that drug program because it's pretty obvious, at least as far as I'm concerned, that every youngster in this country, in one way or the other, unless we do something about this problem, is going to come into contact with marijuana or heroin or some kind of drug in some kind of way. And unless we change our priorities, unless we put a great deal of emphasis on helping our young people, I just can't see the drug pro pro problem diminishing in the way that it should. And it is, to me, the worst problem that we have in this country today, mm -hmm. even worse than the race problem.
Have you spoken to your friends in Washington about trying to get more done about that? Well, we thought that uh, when we talked to Buick Hume, the commissioner of baseball, and Joe Reichler, that something was going to be done more than it is. I think baseball and football, when they go out and send their kids or out to the, on television and say, this is the way I'd like to rack up the drug program, you know, it means absolutely nothing because 99% of the kids who are involved in drugs aren't looking at that program, and it doesn't okay. touch them. It doesn't mean a thing to them. But I, I would certainly have loved to have seen baseball because the kids today are the, the, the fans in the stands tomorrow, you know. If baseball could have put on a game of, for the drug program to build an institution to help these kids, now I think they're making a concrete uh, contribution to, to the problem. So while we talk to them about it, certainly not, a great, not enough has been done. New York. New York does more in terms of drugs than the fellow, whole federal government does. And I think there's a recognition here in New York in terms of the drug program more so than there is in the rest of the country. Perhaps it's because we have the greatest problem, but certainly there more has been done. I don't say it's been that successful, but more has been done than anything else. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will be back right after this message, our local station. Thank you, Jackie Robinson, George Plimpton, Daniel Fader, for being here. The book we were talking about is called The Naked Children, published by Macmillan. And tomorrow night, uh, Patty Shayefsky, Allen Ginsberg, Christopher Isherwood will be here, and um, Earl Father Hines. Join us. <laughs>